Ladies and gentlemen, please stand by. Your webinar is about to begin. Please use the volume control on your computer to adjust the sound for this presentation. Good day and welcome everybody to the Canadian Obesity Network public webinar series. Today's presentation is Swimming Against the Flood, How the World We've Built Challenges Both Weight and Health. My name is Dawn Hatanaka, Education Director for the Canadian Obesity Network, and I'll be hosting today's webinar. This public webinar series is an exciting opportunity for the Canadian Obesity Network to interact with Canadians to disseminate credible and evidence-based information about obesity. Through this platform, experts will weigh in on issues on obesity bias and discrimination, prevention and treatment, policy and more. If you'd like to be part of our public community and want to be first to hear about future webinars, please opt in to be a member at obesitynetwork.ca backslash public. An archive of this webinar will be posted and available for viewing on the webinars page. Due, the, due to the extremely high volume of requests to join this presentation, we've disabled microphone and question and answer features. However, we do want to answer any questions you might have, so if you have questions you'd like to ask the speaker, you may do so via social media or in the evaluation survey at the end of this presentation. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Yoni Friedhoff. Dr. Friedhoff is an assistant professor of medicine, sorry, family medicine, at the University of Ottawa. In 2004, he became the founder and medical director of the Bariatric Medical Institute in Ottawa, which provides non-surgical weight management. His very popular book, The Diet Fix, Why Diets Fail and How to Make Yours Work, was published by Random House Crown Harmony in March 2014. He is one of Canada's most outspoken obesity experts and a very popular blogger at weightymatters.ca. And now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Friedhoff. Thank you, Don. Um, I'm happy to be here, although uh, we've had some technical difficulties. Hopefully this time will be a charm. So uh, before I start, let's talk a little bit about some disclosures. I do have some. So primarily there are relationships with non-commercial interests where I've given talks and someone has paid for me to come down and give that talk. Um, and Ontario's Ministry of Health who are funding two programs in my office right now. I think it is important to note that I write a non-monetized blog. Uh, Don had mentioned it, it's called Weighty Matters. And the reason I bring it up is just because I, I do write about the things I will be speaking about here and clearly that's something you should consider. Uh, as far as commercial interests go, there's two. I do have a book, as Don mentioned, The Diet Fix, which you can technically buy, um, perhaps by uh, um, extension you'd imagine that there is some, some interest there. Uh, but we're not talking about anything in relation to the diet fix uh, today. And also I am the co-owner of uh, my medical office, which again uh, really has no bearing on today's talk. And so to get right into it, today I want to talk a little bit about flooding. Um, Flood-wise, this one's pretty obvious. So this is the floodwaters of Hurricane Katrina. Uh, these waters actually reached as far as 19 kilometers from the beach. There was no mistaking this for what it was. Yet, we do have a flood now, and it's doc Dr. David Katz from Yale who has been using this analogy, and I've been stealing it regularly since I first heard it from him, um, but I give credit. Uh, and uh, in any case, the, the flood that we're seeing right now is chronic non-communicable disease. Diseases like obesity and like type 2 diabetes. I mean, this is a real problem. It's a growing problem and it is a global problem. And so many times when people consider this flood, there's really one finger that gets pointed by people. And it gets pointed at the food industries where this is really sort of a representation of our modern day flood, where it's the foods that were being served on a regular basis. And it's the food industries co-optation of cartoon characters to try to entice children to make bad choices or to pester parents or the food industry's purchase of stars like Beyonce to sell soda water, liquid candy, again primarily I would imagine to the people she influences most who are the younger people in our population, our teens and our children. And there's this, you know, push I think out there for people to consider the food industry to be Dr. Evil of the world and I may surprise you when I say that I don't agree. Um, I, I don't think that the food industry is inherently evil. I think the food industry is doing what the food industry does, which is its very best to sell food. Now, the food industry is not a social service organization. Its job is to maximize profit. 
If profits and health collide, then they will help, and if profits and health do not collide, then they will hinder, and that's just the nature of everything. But in the discussion of the flooding that we're seeing right now, the food industry can't be ignored. Really, though, it's the relationship between the food industry and public health that I want to start this talk off and touch on. And we'll start with this photograph here. This photograph is a photograph from 2004, I believe, or 2005. This was the very first kickoff meeting of the development of Canada's current 2007 edition food guide. Of the guests who were invited to this talk, these are not drop-in guests, these are by invitation only, one-third of the invitees represented the food industry. In fact, the food industry was involved at virtually every single stage of consultation of Canada's food guide. Uh, including among them was the, at time, the nutrition manager for the BC Dairy Foundation, uh, which is a not-for-profit organization with a mandate of increasing the consumption of milk. And at the time, too, they had a campaign going on on their website where the tagline of the campaign was, don't tell mom, but chocolate milk is good for you. Well, um, Health Canada, at least with our food guide, seemed to have agreed at the time, which was a surprising thing in my mind, given that chocolate milk has oftentimes, depending on the brand, uh, double the calories of Coca-Cola and 20% more sugar. Uh, and yet, here it is as one of the recommended servings from Canada's Food Guide. And no doubt, if you have a child in elementary school, you will know that the chocolate milk program is running very strong in this country. It's a strange thing that we tell people that chocolate or that milk is such a remarkable beverage that we need to ensure children consume it by adding sugar and chocolate flavor to it. You know, it's like suggesting that uh, fruit is so important that if they don't eat apples on their own, we should serve kids apple pie. I think it's a strange thing. And I do, I have to believe uh, that there was some influence from the food industry in making this recommendation. And whether there was influence from the food industry or not, they certainly took advantage of the recommendation. Uh, beyond the chocolate milk program in schools, which they promote very heavily to the children and their parents, uh, this advertisement came out a few days after the new food guide was released. Two glasses today because they'll need it tomorrow. And those two glasses, well, Canada's Food Guide to Healthy Eating uh, recommends two servings of chocolate milk every single day. It's a very strange statement in a country that struggles with weight uh, the way Canada does. Also strange is the fact that Canada's Food Guide suggests that juice is in fact a fruit equivalent. You know, other food guides around the world actually admonish consumers to ensure that they restrict juice consumption, pointing out very clearly that juice is not a fruit equivalent. The World Health Organization and Canada's Heart and Stroke Foundation also both point to juice as being a uniquely problematic beverage because it's providing a huge amount of sugar and not much in the way of nutrition. We also know that when we consume uh, liquid calories, we don't compensate for them. And what that means is drink a glass of juice with breakfast, versus drinking a zero calorie beverage with breakfast and you'll have the same breakfast plus the calories of the beverage. Again, a problem in a country where we struggle with weight and diet related illness. Of course, the food industry, again, doing what it does, not anything wrong, but simply telling what is sadly the truth here in this country, um, that fruit and juice are equivalents. And these advertisements are regularly still found in our glossy magazines. And on the fronts of packages, if you go shopping in the supermarket and you walk by the drink box aisle, uh, sadly, you will see lots of cartoon characters beckoning to your children. But you'll also see something that tells you that, in fact, you're giving your kids fruit, which I don't happen to agree with. But yet, there it is. Every 250 ml glass of Tropicana provides you with two full servings of fruit, um, according to Canada's Food Guide. And then the same for grape juice, where it says no added sugar ever as well, as if that's a good thing. When you've got a beverage like grape juice and there's 10 teaspoons of sugar per glass, it is hard to imagine adding more sugar to that. But this is, again, I think, representative of the difficulties associated with including the food industry in a consultative process and giving them a voice. You also see other strange things as a consequence of what the food, in, uh, food guide recommends. 
Canada's Food Guide, again, very strangely in my mind, uh, suggested that refined carbohydrates uh, mattered and that there was a problem that people weren't consuming enough servings of things. We needed to steer people to get enough. And that, of course, led to this very strange practice, uh, which was a note sent home in a young child's lunchbox. The young child had had a stew, a homemade stew, sent along with him for breakfast or for lunch. Uh, I think there was two children, actually. And this apparently upset the school because there weren't grain products. And to rectify the situation, the kids were given ultra-processed Ritz crackers and the parents were fined $10. I don't think we would see uh, the inclusion of refined grains in our school food programs if our food guide was more directive about the fact that ultra-processed grains do not have the same benefits that we would see with whole grains. You know, and again, I, I find it strange that we are continuing to invite the food industry to have votes. This is from 2012, where a food industry representative from the Food and Consumer Products of Canada sat on a very small panel of people uh, that were tasked with providing recommendations to the Ontario government to address childhood obesity. Now, I have no issue with the food industry coming to testify before such a panel, but giving them a vote is a very strange thing. And frankly, of the recommendations that came out of that panel, and some were quite solid, I do feel some were weaker than they might have been had there not been people from the food industry. And it wasn't just this one representative. This was just their excited press release at the time. Um, I think it's problematic that the food industry is able to satisfy the requirements of our school food programs. Now, the fact that it is virtually impossible to find a school nowadays that does not teach children that fast food pizza on a weekly basis is normal um, is problematic. And problematic, too, that those same fast food pizzas uh, can comply immediately with on new government policies. This one was a press release from Pizza Pizza who reported that they were able to comply with the new policy uh, one year earlier, that our new policies don't exclude fast food pizza from our children's weekly experiences, uh, I think is a worrisome thing because even if the pizza were incredibly helpful, well, it, we're still teaching kids that fast food on a weekly basis is normal. That's a problem. What's also a problem is we've now decided that baked potato chips are healthy. I mean, that is what Ontario school food policy has done. So you are allowed to put baked potato chips in vending machines in Ontario schools. I believe it's the same for other provinces and other provincial uh, healthy eating programs as well. I don't think we should be selling junk food and calling it healthy. And that is ultimately what we're doing with these sorts of products and promotions. You know, telling the kids that you, the unhealthy stuff is no longer going to be sold in schools and then selling virtually the same stuff. I mean, the Lay's on the right, the baked chips, you know, they have very similar amounts of calories and sodium. And again, they're potato chips. I don't think that anybody confuses actual potato chips with a healthy choice. But I bet you some people provide themselves more permission to buy the baked stuff because they feel it's not as bad. You know, selling less awful food and describing it as good for you is a problem, and it is our new normal. Normal, too, is junk food fundraising. So again, pizza is something that has really championed school fundraising, and I appreciate schools need money, but again, I don't think we need to provide ourselves as a society with permission to eat more ultra-processed foods. I keep using the term ultra-processed. Um, it's terminology that was developed out of some researchers in Brazil, but according to them, 62% of the calories Canadians consume come from ultra-processed food. Stuff like fast food pizzas and Lunchables and pizza pockets and you know all the stuff that's easier and more convenient and yes i believe that selling pizza is easier and more convenient as far as fundraising goes but is that the right thing we should be doing as a society here's domino's dough raising pizza night i was at a checkout counter in a local supermarket where i was asked when i was with my young daughter whether I wanted to buy her a $3 sugar cookie where $1 goes to Chio. Chio is the children's hospital here in eastern Ontario. I probably would have donated a dollar directly to Chio, 
but I'm not sure why I needed to be faced with the choice of this sugar cookie and with my child who, of course, wanted one at the time. Nor was I understanding of the fact that selling sugar cookies is clearly much more profitable for the supermarket than it was for the children's hospital. I mean, if we're going to do it, let's do it right and really uh, raise a lot of money. Here's a BC hospital that's selling $5 chocolate bars to help benefit BC's children's hospital. Again, uh, in the context of the world that we live in right now, should we be encouraging or permitting more purchases of junk food? Slices for Smiles is a campaign you may have seen. This benefits the Children's Miracle Network, which is a network of various children's hospitals. According to an online press release, uh, over the past seven years of fundraising, this program has raised a million dollars, which sounds wonderful. But then you've got to break the numbers down a bit more. So a million dollars in seven years is about $143,000 per year. And there's 12 hospitals. So if we divide that up by the 12 hospitals, we get to just shy of $12,000 per hospital per year. That works out to be about $32.60 a day to sell fast food to people in the name of health, in a sense, or healthy fundraising. In the case of my local hospital, which is CHEO, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, this campaign that again provides permission for the purchase of junk food encourages its consumption, quite frankly, pays for 4.3 seconds worth of CHEO's daily operating expenses. You know, we don't fundraise selling tobacco products. At some point, I do think as a society, we need to question this practice. And it really is a very prevalent practice. This was uh, Sick Kids Foundation selling towers of onion rings. When I wrote to uh, Sick Kids Foundation about this practice, I got a letter back saying that the corporate sponsors offer a wide range of food and beverage choices, including low fat options for the health conscious consumer as if that excuses the encouragement of purchasing, you know, a tower of onion rings, again, in support of sick kids. Should we be selling illness to help pay for health? Here's the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, and they are real champions of junk food fundraising. They do this all over the place with all sorts of different partnerships, again, selling chocolate bars. And, you know, there may be some irony in a uh, Diabetes Research Foundation selling chocolate bars to help support research. Now, and then we see strange partnerships with the food industry. I mean, really strange, but they're everywhere. This is a pretend McDonald's kiosk that you can have your kids drive through in a children's museum in Ontario. This was Ontario Science Centre that was having a, a demonstration or a display on gaming. And if you then went to the cafeteria, you could get your gamer grub combo of a 591 mil pop, a small bag of chips and a chocolate bar. I mean, the fact that this was being offered again in a science center was a surprising thing to me, but not so surprising in that this is totally normal nowadays. I clipped this uh, from uh, the Globe and Mail a number of years ago about Fort York. And during the War of 1812, young kids entered Fort York full of courage, strength and pride. This weekend, they'll leave full of cookies, cake and candy. Again, we use food constantly to reward kids, to entertain kids, to pacify kids, but nobody questions it. And when we do question sort of new normals, people often get mad at you for questioning it. At least that's been my experience. Here's Boo at the Zoo in the States, I believe, where um, you could go before Halloween. So this is, you've got three weekends before Halloween to go to the zoo with over 9,000 pounds of candy at trick-or-treat stations. I mean, going to the zoo is fun all by itself. Do we really need to hand out candy? Or how about in our schools? You know, this was a presentation one school was making uh, about sight word reading, I think, for kindergartners. And beyond teaching kindergartens the improper spelling of the word loving, we are using McDonald's to teach kids to read. And we're using fast food again in schools constantly because it's so easy. If you've got kids in school, you may know that there is this phenomena that didn't exist, certainly when I was a kid, called the hundredth day of school, where you celebrate the fact that it is the hundredth day of school. 
And many schools celebrate again by collecting junk food and giving out to children because it is so easy to do and it makes kids happy. And again, this is our new normal. There's programs that the, the fast food organizations are getting involved in. Literacy is a new thing that fast food is trying to get involved with because again, getting involved with a cause that is in and of itself a justifiable and important cause is good for the food industry. This is a read your heart out coupon that's been given out by teachers to kids who read. I thought reading was its own reward. I'm not really sure why we need to give out um, coupon to kids who are reading and you know these sorts of campaigns um, exist as well here's boston pizza's partners in reading program october 2015 you get a free kids meal from boston pizza again if you read this was a movie that kids were going to from school this movie from school was at nine in the morning but of course kids need to be able to choose their you know, sugar sweetened beverage and candy when they're going to the movies. Because going to the movies at 9 a.m. on a school day is not reward enough. You need junk food as well. Here was the high school exam cram. High school exam cram was something that the Guelph Library was, was promoting. You know, if you come and study and tell us what you're studying for, we'll give you snacks. And of course, the snacks that kids are being given are ultra processed junk food. Why are we rewarding kids with junk food for studying? What message are we teaching kids that everything they do should be rewarded with junk food? This was an internet safety uh, talk that was being provided in a mall. Uh, and of course, for everybody who finished this talk, and the, the target of the talk again was children, was a free small fries from McDonald's. And you've got to figure that's not all that's going to be ordered when that free small fries coupon is being utilized. This one was bizarre. Here, if you use Interac, you get a free donut from Tim Hortons. This one was given to a child who was their school's patroller of the month. Again, uh, this is the food industry partnering with the school. The school probably should know better, but again, if this is normal, why question it? This can't, this coupon for or this gift card was given to the top lap runner in a school for winning their track meet in Brampton. And this is not just Brampton, actually. I've seen these campaigns all over the place. Uh, the police are giving out coupons for, in this case, uh, uh, Max Milk, I think, Frosty. This Frosty has 26 teaspoons of sugar in it and the same calories as you'd find in a McDonald's quarter pounder. Again, teaching children that good deeds or really anything is rewarded with junk food and that it's okay and associating really positive emotions with these foods that perhaps we should be minimizing uh, in our diets as a whole. You know, and then we see other allowances for the food industry. So we allow the food industry to advertise to our kids. So recently the Senate in Canada put out a series of recommendations, including one that we should stop allowing the food industry to advertise to our kids. And we should probably stop allowing Fruit Loops to suggest itself to be healthy with front of package claims like good source of fiber, natural fruit flavors. And although you can't see it, there's probably a vitamin D uh, shout out as well, because I do know that Fruit Loops will advertise the fact it's got vitamin D in it. I mean, why are we letting the food industry advertise to our most vulnerable uh, population, our children? You know, my kids are pretty savvy, but I would pick Don Draper versus my kids. Uh, Don Draper's gonna win every time. And Don Draper nowadays, well, he's got neuropsychologists and fMRI studies and incredibly sophisticated research that will help him convince my kids to buy something. Media literacy teaching is not going to be enough. We see other strange partnerships like this one. This is a photograph that was snapped, I believe, by pediatrician Dan Flanders um, in a hospital. This was North York General Hospital, if my memory serves correctly, where the hospital was serving, you know, pizza and encouraging the consumption of fairly large quantities of it, two slices, because uh, you can get a free movie admission and you can see all the other junk food we sell in hospitals. It's normal to do that. 
But we do draw lines about what we sell places, right? Hospitals don't sell tobacco. And yes, you can go across the street and buy it. Sometimes I hear that as an argument for why it's okay for hospitals to sell junk food. Well, they can go across the street and get it. Well, that might not be the best uh, argument as to why we should continue to encourage it. And certainly, were hospitals to make a very clear-cut decision as a whole to stop selling foods like this, maybe that would inspire others to change. Of course, it's not just uh, what's being sold in the cafeterias. This was a lunch being served to kids in a local children's hospital as well. We do need to ask ourselves what we're doing when we are constantly, again, promoting junk food. Here is the meal options for a city-run summer camp, where Tuesdays you can have hot dogs, potato chips, and juice, and Wednesdays pizza cookies and juice, Thursdays chicken sliders cookies and juice, fries, freezies, and juice. There are no other options. So your other option as an adult would be to, in fact, send your own lunch, which is totally fine, but perhaps that might affect your child some who is going to be wondering why they are so different than everybody around them. I, I, I think this is a problem. Uh, thankfully, this campaign is over, but this was a campaign that had been launched just a few years ago. It was 2011, I believe, where Nutella, the breakfast spread um, was partnering up with uh, something called uh, the breakfast table, which in turn was partnering up with Breakfast for Learning, which is a national nonprofit trying to help provide breakfast to kids who were unfortunately not getting breakfast, a very worthy cause. But Nutella, um, if you look at it and compare it with chocolate frosting, um, it actually has 25% fewer calories than chocolate frosting and 27% less sugar, at least than this uh, brand over here. Uh, recently, I noticed that Twix actually created this product, uh, just was released in the UK last week, um, where it's spreadable candy, it's spreadable Twix bars, and yet again, Nutella wins. Nutella has more sugar than actual spreadable candy, and here it was being sold on the back of a national nonprofit designed to help with nutrition and health. This photograph of vending machines is just some of the vending machines that you can find at my local city-run arena. They are, of course, full of junk food. Again, I wonder whether or not our city-run institutions should be providing junk food to children or to adults or to anybody who walks through those doors. Yes, of course, we can buy it across the street, but again, I'm not sure that's a great argument. And then there's this idea that exercise and food go hand in hand. This very cute little guy uh, was given that snow cone after his 200 meter fun run. That was his reward for the fun run. We need to reward apparently exercise with food. Um, that is a problematic, very normalized message. Um, we see partnerships between Coca-Cola and Participation still. So uh, Participation and Coca-Cola have been working together for an awfully long time. If you look at some of the old Sogo Active uh, campaign information, there really was this strong push about activity and obesity. And Coca-Cola, of course, will sponsor events like this uh, race uh, for kids. It's the Coca-Cola Kids Fun Run. I forget what country this was in and you win uh, medals for your Coca-Cola Classic. We've got Hershey's partnering with Run, Jump, Throw and Athletics Canada. The new logo of Athletics Canada's Run, Jump, Throw are actual Hershey's Kisses. I I'm not making this up. It's actually the new logo of Run, Jump, Throw. And what does Hershey's do with these sorts of partnerships? So this is a partnership that existed before the Run, Jump, Throw partnership, but again, in conjunction with both Her Hershey's and Athletics Canada, they have Hershey's track and field games. Well, guess who shows up at Hershey's track and field games? The Milk Dud guy, the Hershey's Kisses guy, Reese's Peanut Butter Cups and Jolly Ranchers. I mean, and we're allowing these people to parade in front of our kids. We get excited by the fact that they've given us some sponsorship money and then we let them do this. Yes, this is a problem. Here's McDonald's track and field games. Here's McDonald's atomic hockey. And certainly everybody in Canada is going to recognize what these are, and probably some of the international folks will as well. These are Timbits. Well, Tim Hortons is a donut company, basically, or a coffee and donut company. Um, and they own youth sport in Canada. 
They own Timbits Minor Hockey, Timbits Soccer, Timbits Ringette, Timbits Curling, Timbits Football, Timbits Volleyball, Timbits Beach Volleyball, Timbits Softball. This is Timbits Lacrosse. I'm sorry I couldn't find a logo that associated with it. And they've got a program now. It's called the I Just Played I'm Thirsty program. And actually, this applies not just to soccer, but to hockey as well. And if you sew a Timbits patch onto your kid's uniform, after the game, you are allowed to go to Tim Hortons to tell them that you just played, you're thirsty, and your child will receive either a lemonade or a hot chocolate, depending on the season. You know, I prefer the old days when advertising was more direct and to the point. This is what it's all about. It's about selling Timbits. It's about selling donuts and brand loyalty, and it's selling them to our kids who are running around as walking advertisements for a donut company. And we sit back and look at this and say, eh, no problem, I'm really happy my kid has the uniform. Um, the message about activity and exercise is a, you know, a very treasured message for the food industry. Uh, there's Coca-Cola's Active Balance Lifestyle, where the point is, is that you're supposed to balance your intake of awful products um, with physical activity. Uh, so Coca-Cola has Active Balance Lifestyles, McDonald's has Balanced Active Lifestyles, General Mills has a Balanced and Healthy Lifestyle, PepsiCo a Balanced Lifestyle, Unilever a Balanced Diet and Lifestyle, Mars a Well-Balanced Lifestyle, and Nestle a balanced lifestyle. They sure like balance. And, you know, thanks to Indra Nooyi, the CEO of Pepsi, you know, she really explains why they like balance so much. They like balance so much because it, it, it takes their products off the hook. It's not their products. It's not Pepsi that's leading to the problem. And according to Indra Nooyi, there's no question that sedentary lifestyles have caused the obesity crisis to get out of control. And that if all consumers exercised, did what they had to do, the problem of obesity wouldn't exist. Now, I'm sure that some of the people who are listening to this webinar right now know that the data on exercise as a driver of weight loss is very disappointing. You know, it would seem that exercise, looking at populations, might help people to gain weight slightly more slowly, but they're still going to gain. Of course, you'll always hear stories about individuals whose exercising led them to make major lifestyle changes, and good for them. But as a general recommendation, you know that you can eat what you want so long as you exercise, that is very problematic to weight. And yet we have partnerships with people, again, who probably should know better. This is CardioSmart from the American College of Cardiology, who were hosting a Coca-Cola Family Field Day. And what happened at this field day? This was a few years ago in 2013. Well, there was a Coke open happiness truck, which if you've ever seen, of course, gives out Coke products. There was a kid zone and there was a health and wellness expo where presumably they were given a handout called balancing calories with physical activity. And this message of balance, you know, you probably heard there was something called the Global Energy Balance Network. Its job was to promote this very message that you can balance your uh, your intake with your output. It was a Coca-Cola funded program. Uh, the New York Times did an expose on it and uh, full disclosure, I was involved in uh, that expose. Um, that program got shut down, but this one didn't. And for the Americans who are listening to this webinar, this one should alarm you quite a lot. This is called Energy Balance 101. Energy Balance 101 is a program that has now reached over 50% of uh, the United States' elementary schools. It's a curriculum that was designed by the Healthy Weight Commitment Foundation. The Healthy Weight Commitment Foundation is a food industry organization where people like the sugar sweetened beverage industry um, put their money. And they're promoting this message that you can find your balance. You can find your balance. And what does that mean? Well, if you look at one of their curriculum pieces, uh, this was a quiz for the kids. When you know you will be eating lots of treats at a birthday party, do you A, B, or C? And the answer was B, get a little extra exercise. 
apparently this particular curriculum is reaching 12 and a half million students in schools and has also been adopted by the Girl Scouts. Then there's this program, Mixify, Balance What You Eat, Drink, and Do. And so the Mixify tour is geared directly at teens, and as you can see by the sponsors at the bottom, Coca-Cola, Dr. Pepper, Pepsi, and the American Beverage Institute, um, there's a very clear message that they want to promote. And again, that message is balance, where they have an actual Jenga uh, table or Jenga life-size Jenga blocks, where you can literally balance what you eat, drink, and do. Where, of course, that's the message. You can eat awful food so long as you do a little bit of extra exercise, just like Energy Balance 101 says. And then we see these uh, sorts of advertisements. This is, again, using heroes, uh, kids' heroes, usually. Um, I guess adults have sport heroes as well, but perhaps they won't be as influential. Uh, but these are heroes suggesting that we need to refuel after exercise. And that's a pretty common message. Uh, I don't know if you've got a child, but if you do, you'll know that if they bend so much as a single blade of grass in an after-school sport, someone's going to be giving them a popsicle or an ice cream sandwich because we have, again, normalized this message that exercise warrants refueling, that somehow it is good for you, it is important. And unless you are truly doing extreme amounts of exercise, long endurance sports, uh, really uh, vigorous stuff, um, you don't need to refuel with anything other than water. And then again, we see people getting involved with this message that perhaps should know better. This is the American Heart Association who have teamed up with the NFL's Play 60 program. For those who aren't aware, the NFL Play 60 program well, it's a program designed to fuel up to play 60, like you need fuel to run around for 60 minutes. I don't think you need fuel to run around for 60 minutes, nor do I think these kids at a fuel up to play 60 event were running around for 60 minutes. I think they just went to an event where they were given giant glasses of chocolate milk and literally told that these glasses were very helpful and probably were told, judging from the signature on that little boy's shirt, uh, they were told that by one of their heroes. Uh, we see Nesquik has partnered with um, the American Youth Soccer Organization to promote chocolate syrup after games. You know, and all of this involvement for the food industry with sport has a purpose as well. The purpose is messaging. And so this particular study back in the Journal of Science and, uh, and Medicine and Sport found that there's about four weeks worth of brand exposure that the food industry is gaining by sponsoring sport. I guess all this to say that we have a very unlevel playing field right now in society. And we really do have a torrential current of crappy foods. Uh, being pushed on our kids, not just by the food industry, but by people who probably should know better, by teachers, uh, by coaches, by hospitals. You know, it, it doesn't matter by who. It, it, it is a constant thing. And when you point this out, sometimes people say about any particular thing, well, then, you know, Yoni, you're making a big deal out of this. It's just one. It's just one chocolate bar. It's just one glass of chocolate milk. It's just one. But it's not just one. I mean, it really is this constant thing. You know, it doesn't matter what the kids are doing. And I keep coming back to the kids because that's where I see it the most, but it's adults too. But, you know, my kid will have a reading club after school for eight year olds. and. Rather than coming home being excited to talk about the book that they all discussed, she's excited to talk about the bowl of Twizzlers that were provided to her. You know, and then there's this other argument that we could, you know, deal with this all just by saying no. You know, we as individuals or we as parents can just say no, and that will solve all of these problems. It's a lot of no's. I mean, again, it is a constant stream of no's that would be required. I find that we are suggesting that these two arguments, it's just one or you can just say no, 
amazing. You know, we are in this very strange place where the majority of the public health messaging we've got to deal with diet and weight related illnesses, if we go back to the flood analogy, has been to encourage swimming lessons. Oh, you've got a flood. Well, you, you should really learn how to swim with this flood, you know, and the government should pay for swimming lessons and we should encourage parents to make sure their kids have swimming lessons. You know, what better way to treat a flood than by telling people how to swim? The USDA last week, uh, they published their future directions of what they want to do in the future as far as funding research goes. And their call to action was to fund more individualized educational research so that we can tell everybody one by one what swimming stroke will work best for them with this flood. And it really is a flood. And so if we're talking about floods, what generally needs to happen is we need to come together as a community. These are individuals filling sandbags. Individuals need to fill sandbags. There is always a role for personal responsibility. There's always a role for choice, but that can't be the only thing we use to fight this flood. We need a government to help, to do the heavy lifting, to really put sandbags into place. And there's no shortage of sandbags. You know, the Canadian Senate report talked about a number of things that could be done from revising the food guide so that our institutional food programs improve and that the teaching improves to dietitians and kids in schools, uh, to banning advertising targeting kids. I've heard encouraging reports from places where zoning laws are changing to try to prevent fast food organizations from setting up within walking distance of schools. But I guess all this to say is we have created an environment where if you want to live healthfully, if you want to make healthful choices, you have to go out of your way to do so. You have to go out of your way to regularly say no. You have to go out of your way to find options, to bring them with you. That is backwards. I don't think we should be banning products. I think food is a comfort. I think food is a celebration. I think we need and will continue to use food for those purposes forevermore. I'm not opposed to that. But I would love it if somehow we started to look at our environment, to look at this flood, and to instead of ensure that people need to go out of their way to make healthful choices, to try to craft an environment where we need to go out of our way to make unhealthful choices, where the junk food exists but we have to find it if we want it, rather than to refuse it everywhere we go. And so I want to thank you all for listening to me uh, for the past however many minutes. Uh, if there's questions, I will be happy to answer. And certainly, uh, if you want more information, you can follow me in any one of those various venues. Uh, and have a great day. Bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our webinar for today. Thank you, Dr. Friedhoff, for sharing this information. And thank you to all of you for taking the time to join. For those of you that use social media, you can also tweet to us using hashtag obesitytalk, send a message on Facebook, or click on the survey box in the window of your screen that I'm just bringing over right now. Just click and hit browse to, and that will take you directly to the survey. You may now disconnect and close your browser window. We hope you have a great day.